You're watching Startup Blog Insights with Taffy Williams. This month, we're talking about three factors that turn a great idea into a valuable business. Welcome to another Nerd Stalker interview, everyone. Uh, good morning. This is Greg Gloria, AK Social Greg, on Twitter for the Nerd Stalker Media Network. Today, we'll be continuing our monthly segment, or actually, uh, continues our segment from probably uh, February at this point, which is called Startup Blog Insights with uh, examiner, writer, and entrepreneur Taffy Williams, who is the co founder and CEO of Colonial TDC, which uh, offers a team of uh, scientific and business professionals and experts to build and grow medical and technology companies. Basically, he's in the biotech space, guys. So Taffy also writes for the small business section of examiner.com and with his own personal advice based on his personal insights. And he has his own blog called Startup Blog. So anyway, good morning, Taffy, and welcome to Startup Blog's Insights for July 2015, live from North Carolina. Hi, how are you doing this morning? Good, good, good. It's it's great to catch up with you. I, we were talking offline with Taffy, and he, he's been a busy man, and uh, he's been showing me a lot of his uh, photography. And, and you know, we'll go to this aside real quick. But if you haven't seen his photography, go to his website, colonialtdc.com, and he has a he has a section there for his photos, and he has some pretty interesting photos from San Francisco. Every place he visits, he has interesting photos. But but anyway, let's let's talk about ideas this month. And uh, we'll use your article you wrote on examiner.com called Three Factors That Turn a Great Idea into a Valuable Business. Yeah. And, and this is really important because I think we all generate a lot of valuable ideas, but we don't get off the dime sometimes on them, right? Right. And so in your article, um, you know, you suggested building a, a long last, you know, you, you said that a product idea is always. Uh, great in the eyes of the inventor. Inventors sometimes elect to become entrepreneurs and create startups to exploit the inventions. It's easy to focus on creating a first-class product that looks and works great. After all, the concepts and vision were likely part of a path leading to the invention. However, the ability to create a viable business <laughs> requires you know something more. So let's let's talk about what's that more part. Huh? Um, so uh, let's discuss that. Uh, so the first one is, uh, you know, that turn your ideas into value businesses is the payer, the guy holding the funds to give you to make your business viable, right? Well, yeah. I mean, it's, it's not like the investment funds, but it can be. It's the people that are interested in the product. So, so uh, if you are creating a product and, you're, and you want to price your product at a price point that they're not interested, they're not going to sell. If you want to price your product at a point where uh, it's reasonable, but let's say it's an insurance company pays for the product and they're looking at margins, but the person has filed with medical insurance to get it, but the insurance company refuses to pay for that because they're watching costs, you know, who's buying, who's actually paying for it. Uh, you know, so you have to pay attention to who is paying for the product and whether they're willing to pay for the product. That's not a trivial issue. Mm. If you, if you uh, design a product that's, um, and, and this happens quite often in the medical space, if you design a product that fits one uh, type of physician, but that physician is not the one that controls the patients, mm. the, uh, he's going to lose business. That individual that's losing the business is going to fight against you and transition of use of that product because they're going to lose their customers. So okay. you have to look at the dynamics and who is actually paying and what effect it might have on those individuals paying for the product and whether there are changes within the marketplace that cause somebody to win or lose and, uh, it, and cause uh, your adoption to not be what you're hoping for it to be. Great example, working with somebody right now who's got a, a software program. Software program fits within uh, a, a medical space and it's designed to help reduce the, uh, improve healthcare and reduce readmission rates at the hospitals, right? Wow. Problem wow. is who pays, who's going to pay for the service? So the hospitals don't want to pick up any extra expenses is really should fit within the counties and the county should host it because it's beneficial for all the people in the county, but the county doesn't want to pay for it and they don't have the funds. We're trying to get it into a state. Well, the state doesn't want to pay for it. They're trying to figure out how to cut expenses. 
So we're trying to figure out how to get Medicare and Medicaid to put it in, but they got limited budget. If you can't figure out who's paying for your product and figure out if they're going to buy it, and if you can get it to them at a price point that you can make money, you don't have a product. All you got is an idea. Mm -hmm. oh, I <laughs> so see. keep in mind who's, who's paying, who are you selling to, and are they really the ones that control it, and will they pay to get it, and is it going to affect anybody else such that, you know, that it might affect your dynamics in a way that you won't get adoption? Yeah, you know, that's a very big part um, in the uh, in any product. What I notice is, is, is actually the pricing of, of something to gain what you just talked about, right? Yeah. Because, because I've seen a lot of business models where, you know, they were very optimistic, but they went to some price point area that was just low adoption and almost the barrier, barrier was high is what, yeah. like what we're saying, right? And, but you know, you work in the biotech space, that must be even more difficult, right? It's critical. I mean, literally we, we were out in one company that I was with, we were out competing against, you know, in a, in a sector which was dominated by, um, cardi dominated by radiologists, but we were pitching the cardiologists and the cardiologists would be stealing from the radiologists and the radiologists weren't turning their patients over. Oh. Not gonna happen. <laughs> yeah, 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 it is. It is when you go out to raise capital, essential that you're able to describe to potential investors how you're going to capture the market, and they always ask who wins and who loses, and they want to know whether you're really going to get adoption. Well, that's this is, that's, this, that's not trivial. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, that's you know, I think that's a great segue to your next section. Is you know, how, you know, you talk about the number of payers willing to sustain the business, as you just kind of mentioned, right? I, I mean, that's that's a hard thing to model in certain in certain ideas, right? Yeah, it is. I mean, you know, it's a you know, if you're creating a game and your parents have to pay for the game, and you create the game in such a way that the parents aren't going to pay for the game because they don't want their kids to have it, you're not going to get it. Kids may want it. You know, uh, if you create the get it created such that they're the ones paying, but the kids love it and the parents are not objecting to give it to them, you have a better chance of getting adoption, right? Right, 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 right. Well, yeah, and 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 I know, you know, I mean, every market's going to be a little bit different, right? So it's kind of hard. Markets to are not, really, yeah, your market yeah. is how much you're selling the product for times the number of people you can actually catch or capture. Right. Okay. Right. So, so if you, first of all, you have to worry about who's paying for it. So you can then estimate who it is you're going, you have as a potential pool to capture. Next thing is what's your price points, what's your margins? And are mm -hmm. you going to be able to sell enough of the product to make money? So I was talking to a physician the other day because we had invented a product and the product is already, we've licensed it to somebody and they're selling it. He says, you know, they're selling it for $2,000 a piece. It's like, I could have made this thing for 50 bucks. I said, you just made it no longer a product. Why would somebody pick up and sell something for 50, you know, for 200,000 cases a year for 50 bucks? And it says, that's not, you know, especially if the margins are, you know, small. And it says, you may be able to make it for that cheap, but nobody's going to be able to go through and pay to spend millions of dollars to develop it. And then they're not going to make any money on it. That's not how they're going to lose money. And it's not going to happen. There's no product mm -hmm. there. So you mm -hmm. have to develop it and you have to now reach a price point that you're still able to justify. And this is more, uh, uh, you know, when you have, it's like you have payers that are in insurance companies. This is also part of your insurance. Supposing the insurance companies look at the price and they say, we're not paying that. <laughs> right. Okay. But you're, that, if they won't pay for it and it's now a high price product, but you need to be that high price for you to make money that cuts into your market. I see. I but see. The market see. is, is it, it requires adoption and it requires the payers to pay, but it now means you have to have your price point so you can still make money. Mm, sure, sure, so you absolutely. To, so you've got to look at those two factors in particular to be able to estimate what your theoretical markets are. And you never quite make your theoretical markets, but let's suppose you hope to capture 25% or 10% of the market, right? right? You know, you're not going to get it if the payers aren't going to pay. And, the, and you're also are getting into a point where the people that are going to use it aren't the ones who control who control the individual or patients or whatever it is, the decision-making process. Right. So, well, yeah. <laughs> and, well, you yeah, and I think what what you're pointing out in your article really is 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 you know how how do you model something that you want to attract investors to? I, I mean, you know, the vi the viability of the model is also, you know, can you get it funded eventually if you need the funding? You know, well, nobody's uh, going to give you money to go out for a hobby. 
<laughs> it's a hobby if you're not making money. <laughs> That's funny. It's a lifestyle, you know, if you're not making money. You, if you're, you know, the investors don't invest because they think you're cute. <laughs> well, maybe they have with you, but no, I don't know. But anyway, <laughs> I don't know about that. But yeah, I wanted to ask you also, there's this third point that, that you talked about in the article, which is, you know, we talked a little bit about this a little bit before is the need, right? Absolutely. So developing your product must have list. That, that's, that's difficult too, I find. It is. We, we actually uh, we were on the fundraising trail with a company I'm working with now. We sat in the room with a physician who invests in the sector that we're in, and he says, you know, they've gotten now to the point where they only invest in things that are have to have, not nice to have. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now it depends on the need. So you know, when you're selling cookies, you know, cookies. <laughs> when you're selling cookies, you know, those are nice to have. You don't have to have them. You know, and so you might be able to, if you're going to a particular marketplace where people are willing to pay expensive, like three, four bucks a cookie or five bucks for a cupcake or whatever it is, you know, it's a nice to have kind of a thing and people will go do it. And, you know, but when you go out and sell rice uh, to uh, a population that doesn't have food, that's a must have. Now mm. you can't, you can't get as much, but there's an, there are things you have to have and there are things that are nice to have. Having things that are must haves will command a better adoption than having things that are nice to have. People can pass up on those, but on the must haves. Insurance companies can pass up on the nice to have, but not the must haves. If a patient's going to die because they don't get something, that's a must have. Like, like when you, um, you know, when you, when you sit down with, let's say you, you know, you Taffy Williams have angel invested into this company, right? And, and you, you know, you obviously, were attracted to them because they gave you a little bit of the needs, but there's some iteration that goes with these needs. I mean, Era, yeah. have you, I mean, how do you, how do you guys iterate or how have you worked with people to iterate down to the, the final yeah. list of needs? You know, oh, it's a, here's, here's the thing. We started out in one company recently uh, with a particular area we thought was important. And then we went in for this question and it's, you know, and, and the question and answer. And we're saying, well, you know, if we use our stuff in that particular indication, I'm not sure whether we wouldn't have issues where the people just didn't really need it, where they've already got other kinds of stuff. We'd be competing against other tests that are out there. And then we found that indication through, after a lot of work using the same test that would go after a population where 50, there's a 50% failure rate and detection of a disease, 50%. Now these people don't realize that there's a 50% failure rate and it's a cancer. And so they're going in, they're getting these tests and they're coming back and, and they find, and they may find later they had cancer, even though they didn't realize that the tests weren't definitive and that they didn't know anything. And so all of a sudden now, uh, by trying to go after that population, um, we can find a route that might make it a must have because it becomes a confirmatory or it becomes a you better follow up more closely or you better not ignore this patient kind of a thing for the physician. It becomes something that might enhance their ability to make sure the physician that the patient does well as opposed to nice to have. And so as you begin to tailor and direct and go for your first indications, you try to make it so that it is uh, more important, you know, as important as possible. And in fact, you, if you can design it in such a way that the doc would get sued if you didn't use it, that's even better. <laughs> well, like what, what, you know, that's the interesting thing about the bio, bio space is, you know, when you look at these tests for failure rates, um, you know, what, what is the optimal? I mean, obviously, 100% would be great, but you never, I, I don't know if I, you ever get there, but is there, in, in a business standpoint, you said, okay, you know, we're at 90% and, and that probably is a viable business, right? I mean, well, you know, you can look at your pricing and stuff. And a lot of times what we're looking at are things that would be, high, uh, high value propositions. So we're always looking at things that are in the hundreds of millions to potentially billion dollar sales. And we construct them to be in that range because okay. the cost of development, the time frame to approval, all the, all the stuff that goes into it requires a lot of money and you have to recover it. So, I mean, you know, if it's a drug, it's even worse than say other things like devices are less expensive. And they could be diagnostics, they could be medical devices. Some of those can be less expensive. Some devices are more expensive. You can spend 
for drugs, sometimes 500 to $3 billion to develop it. Wow. 500 million to 300, 3 billion. Okay. If, wow. So if you, if a big company is developing a blockbuster drug that is, and they're spending that kind of money, how long is it going to take them to recover? So you, people wonder why in the U S they charge so much because they have to be able to recover their, their discovery work stuff because not every drug works. So mm -hmm. if you got, let's say you got one out of a couple of hundred that you've done where you spent hundreds of millions to billions of dollars, you know, and got it, but you get a success along the way or two successes or three successes, you now got to recover everything because you've got a return to investors at better than a 14, 15% return on, uh, you know, on their investment. Well, in order to do that, you got to have uh, those kinds of revenue streams coming in, which means your margins, are, you know, your, your price points are going to be higher. So after things go off pat and you see the prices fall, because the fact is, is that, you know, there's a lot more competition, but when you're on patent, you're able to charge higher amounts. Mm. So they mm. have to charge that to recover or be able to turn and give the right type of return to the investors. Um, you know, uh, otherwise it doesn't make sense for them to develop the stuff. I see. I see. Wow. That's good. People think they're getting cheated in the U S on the drugs. They don't realize what it costs to develop them and how, and what risks the company's taking doing it. Well, yeah. And you know, from a consumer perspective, right. We want the lowest price possible, right? I mean, that yeah. hits our pocketbook. I mean, you know, it, it, <laughs> we don't, we really don't know. Right. We oh. really don't know. Right. I mean, you know, I mean, we, I, I think, you know, it, well, I don't. I don't think we exactly think of this this way, but like you know, aspirin is almost put in the same category as another heavy duty drug. I think sometimes, right? Well, it well, can be, but you yeah. know, but the pricing on that is not as heavy as some of the cancer drugs can be hundreds of thousands of dollars a treatment regimen. Yeah, that's incredible. Well, you know, think, but think of it. You know, why, why would it cost that much? Well, first of all, they had to spend. It didn't reduce the amount they had to spend to develop it. Right. They're still right. having to spend that amount of money, but the number of patients that might be in that particular sector could be 200,000 or less. Right. right. So let's suppose you pick a, a cancer that might have 50,000 patients a year. Okay. Right. And you, you spent, you spent a hundred million to 500 million to develop the drug or more. <laughs> Okay. Right, right. You see right. where this is going? You know, all of a sudden now, uh, if you got fifty thousand patients, how are you going to generate enough money to recover what you got and make a profit in the time frame that's left with a return that will have attracted the investors to get the drug approved in the first place? Right, right, right. Yeah, it's uh, you know that whole space is incredible. It's so different than like the IT space that I'm in. But you know, you, you live that space for your whole career, right? So, so, so the name brand uh, pr drugs might carry margins as high as eighty percent, mm. whereas the generics might carry margins as high as twenty twenty five percent. Wow! <laughs> wow! Wow! Yeah. Within the generic space is such that some of the generic companies have problems. Um, with cash, with, with, with profit. Sure. Sure. I mean, at, I mean, that's low margin for any business, you yeah. know? So, so and it's something that's probably he heavily capitalized, like, you know, uh, pharmaceuticals that, that, that's low. <laughs> yeah. That's extremely low. I'm not sure how you run the business that way, but that's interesting. You know, you're not talking about toys and other things. No, <laughs> so, uh, you know, so, so, you know, the, the key things were, you know, who's paying? Yeah. Who's paying for the product? Do they really need it? What effect and the dynamics of who's paying for the product might there be that would alter how, who captures it? Your market, what's the size of your market? Can you have enough money and cash flow to be interesting to an investor? Is it enough money for you to make money as a company? Is it going to be substantial enough to where, you know, investors would want to come be part of your company? And finally, is did the people really need it? Is it a must have or nice to have? If it's a nice to have, how are you going to make them more interested in getting it? You know, um, you want to see competitions a nice to have? <laughs> yeah. Go look at the wars between, you know, between Apple and uh, Samsung for, for phones. You know, they, they keep tweaking it. They keep adding stuff and trying to, you know, and trying to make it uh, where it's a nice to have. It's almost becoming a must have for people, but, you know, but what is it that attracts them and makes them want yours over something else? And so those are the kinds of factors that go into creating a, a, an idea into a valuable business. Yeah.
Well, thank you. Uh, thank you again for um, doing a startup blogs insights for July here with yeah. us. I, I really appreciate it. And we'll close off the interview. And again, thank you. Uh, for and, and some of the stuff you might learn if you read the book, Think Agile, How Savvy Entrepreneurs Adapt in Order to Succeed. Uh, yes. You know, some of that's captured there as well. Okay. Yeah. And, uh, you know, yeah, I, yeah, I forgot about that. Well, not forgot about it, but you know, we should mention that, that, you know, Taffy has a book called the, you know, think agile and, uh, it's a, it's, it's been selling well yeah. from what I could tell. And, um, it's been getting good press out there. So, you know, capture uh, that on, uh, it's, it's available anywhere online as well as, um, yeah. you know, uh, you can get a physical through amazon.com. So, um, you know, take a look at that one anyway. So, so how can listeners get a hold of you and uh, well, get to know the, you better? On the bottom of the screen, you got a, a nice web link to Colonial TDC. There are links in there to go to the book, that go to the blog, uh, go to the examiner articles. I think there's still one in there for my photography. Um, you can yes. catch some of those. I haven't posted the most recent trip in the photography section, but but uh, you'll see quite a number of, of links that will take you to places uh, you know, and then yeah, I'm on Twitter. Uh, if you go to Twitter, you'll see sometimes or LinkedIn, you'll see sometimes I post articles that may not be found in any of those other places. Uh, yeah, so uh, any of that. Totally, totally. And then, uh, you know, his handle, uh, Taffy Williams handle is uh, T-W-I-L-L-I-2861. So if you want to catch him on Twitter, uh, you could do that. So, but anyway, thanks. Thanks for joining us, everyone. This is Gray Blurry, a.k.a. Social Gray on Twitter for the Nerd Soccer Media Network, where we believe in tech, startups, design, and you. Thanks for joining us, everyone, and be careful out there. Thanks again, Taffy. Bye-bye.